<laughs> Good evening. Missing hand signals. Yeah. <laughs> I, was doing, I was doing 51. I don't know what your hero was doing, but I was worried the camera was going to be reversed. So. I was waiting for you to go and. There you go. Scenes. <laughs> Whereas Euro's throwing up gang signs. I don't know what he's doing over there. Jeez. Oh, <laughs> Brazilian gang signs. Yeah. What's happening, everybody? Not much. Not much. Uh, happy Friday. Yeah. 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 Cool, cool. Uh, uh, yeah. I have to inform you that my qu quarantine is over. So I I'm back with my beers. So uh, I'm going <laughs> to. I was wondering how that was going. It was two weeks uh, on the wagon, right? That you, you, you back yeah. off the line. Not two weeks. Uh, it was uh, actually forty days straight. Holy. Yeah. yeah, yeah, forty days, and I'm proud of myself. But uh, you know, I wasn't as happy as I am today. So. <laughs> <laughs> well, I don't know how you talk to us for two hours a week with without drinks. Uh, you know, it's kind of. He was a little more quiet than normal, so I don't know. It's a, little, a little muted, right? So. <laughs> Yeah. <laughs> I think without yeah. food that, that four PM to seven PM hours, that's really hard to get through. It's like what do you do? You know, yeah, it was tough. <laughs> yeah. Look, I, when when you live in Ireland for, for ten years, like you had to learn something. <laughs> there you go. Like yeah. Yeah. <laughs> so Keelan's from Ireland originally, so if you guys already have that connection, so that's that's great. So, yeah. Where where about you from there? Waterford, down Waterford. South. Mm -hmm. All right, it, it's the place uh, the are famous for the strawberries. There, they're more famous for the crystal, Waterford crystal. But yeah, strawberries as well. Yeah, yeah, I haven't well, been there. I would go on New Year's Eve if they dropped a big giant strawberry instead of a Waterford crystal thing. You know? <laughs> <laughs> uh, I mean, I can see it, but yeah, yeah. yeah. Well, we thank you for coming on. Um, I know I, I reached out to you months ago, and um, at that point, I didn't know the, the comic book was coming out yet. So we had pushed back a bit till you, you had the project coming out. And uh, obviously, it works out perfect because we're a comic book show, too. So uh, it's a yeah. good double whammy here. We, we do horror authors a lot, and we do a lot of comic stuff. So we get both in one show. So. Um, nice. Yeah, I see you got the, uh, the the big poster there in the background for the the book cover there. That's awesome. Yeah, as um, soon as I saw it, I uh, like they showed it to me just to run the file by me to approve it, and I saw it and I just went, "Oh my god!" And I said, "This is going on my wall. I don't care." Yeah, yeah. When you have, when you have my name on there with John Carpenter's name at the top, I thought, you know, it doesn't get any better than that. So yeah, that's it. Up it goes. How did that all come about? I mean, that's that's huge. Um, you know, uh, to have one of your stories adapted to a comic book owned by like the, the horror legend himself. You know, I mean, it's it's wild. Um, how did that all go about? Well, it's actually, I think, at this point, the sixth um, thing that I have adapted for Storm King Comics, which is John Carpenter and Sandy King Carpenter's comic outfit. And how it started was. Um, I was on Twitter one night and I saw Steve Hovecki, who is one of the writers uh, at Storm King. And he was posting, he posted a picture of Tales for Halloween Night, which is uh, John and Sandy's annual collection of Halloween stories by various writers. And I saw the cover and I just thought, wait, John Carpenter has a Halloween anthology out? Why, why is this the first I'm hearing of this? So I immediately bought it. And secondly, immediately messaged Steve Avecki and said, so how do I get in on this? You know, I want to I write something for these, assuming it's an ongoing series. So he basically tagged Sandy King Carpenter and hooked us up. So we started talking and she said, uh, like she didn't know me from a hole in the ground. So she just said, yeah, send something my way and we'll see. So I can't actually, I would think it was Mr. Goodnight was the short story I sent her, but she loved it um so i wrote the script for it they hooked me up with an artist and that was i think that was issue two of tales for halloween night and i think i've done five more since then and uh we happened to be talking one night and i said if you're reading for anything else let me know and she said well we're reading for longer stuff uh for night terrors and i said what's night terrors and she broke it down for me and said well it's 100 page plus stories 
by single authors. So I sent her Sarah Candy and I said, well, I've got this, I think would be a good fit for it. And she agreed. And Jason Felix, the artist came on board and that was it. I, I scripted it during the pandemic uh, when the first year of lockdown, the, when it first started. Um, not only was it like a, a major thrill, but it kept me sane too, you know. <laughs> It was one of those things that you dive into to pretend the rest of the world is that that shit's not happening. So it was a godsend. But yeah, I mean, I just treated it like any other project. I was I worked it on it the same way. But it wasn't really until it came out that I kind of fanboyed over the whole thing, you know. I mean, you have that work ethic where you just, okay, it's a project that needs to be done to the best of your ability. So I did it, delivered it. It got signed off on. It was going through the publishing process. I saw the art, freaked out about the art. It's so good. And then the book's about to be released. And I, I sat back and thought about it. I said, well, this is a this is a project I'm doing with John Carpenter and Sandy King Carpenter. And this is ridiculous. How did this happen? <laughs> I was asking myself the same questions you're probably going to be asking me, including that one. Like, how? <laughs> I feel like that's most of the things that happen with us are like, how the heck did that happen? <laughs> right. Yeah. Right. Oh, that's cool. I, I honestly, um, this was the, because I'd read some of your your prose work, your books, uh, but I didn't realize that you had other comic stuff before Sour Candy. So I'll have to go back and look into that. But um, yeah, it's actually yeah. something I'm very much into. I mean, I kind of I was completely wet behind the ears when I first started it, but I, I basically gave myself a crash course over about six months on the, just the rules of scripting and like like you would with anything else, try to familiarize yourself with it. And I'd read lots of graphic novels, but I'd never attempted to write one. So, yeah, um, I think adapting those stories for the Tales for a Halloween Night series of anthologies kind of prepped me for finally being able to do something that long. Yeah. And I think it worked out well. I'm really, really happy with it. Absolutely. Yeah. It, um, it The story converts so well to, to graphic novel form. And um, and like you said, the art is, yeah. is just, it's so unique too. I feel like I was reading a movie on a, on a page, you know, it was so cool. Um, so, you know, uh, hopefully, um, I don't know, has this, has this been optioned before? I mean, this would make a killer movie. Yeah, it was, it was optioned by Blumhouse when it first came out, Oh, yeah. So I was all, you know, jittery with excitement, but I've learned in the intervening years to be more, you know, wait for it, you know? Yeah. You're sitting in the movie theater eating popcorn, watching the credits roll. Forget it. But, uh, <laughs> so yeah, um, they had it for a while. Uh, Mike Flanagan was involved. Uh, he was, I, I think he was going to be directing it or at least producing it. Um, oh man! And Oz Perkins came on board to do it at another point, and it just all kind of fizzled out in the end. But it is of everything I've written, the thing that gets optioned the most every year. Yeah. There's something else interested and every year it goes nowhere so i don't know maybe i think this kind of functions one of its functions is also kind of like a storyboard that you can just hand to people who are maybe not as enthusiastic about reading prose and trying to visualize it themselves yeah. it's all here you know this is this is how it, it can be done if you want to do it absolutely so we'll, see. we'll see there's been some interest already which is kind of strange yesterday oh nice based, based on the graphic novel so we'll oh, see. okay so, yeah I mean, it doesn't shock me. I was reading through it today. I'm like, man, this is this is perfect for a movie. Like this, this needs to get done. So, um, it's kind of bonkers. I'd love to see somebody do it. <clears throat> a lot of the stuff I write can be more straightforward in terms of the development in the plot, but this one is just batshit. So I'd love to see somebody actually do it that way. You know, and not go, well, no, no, commercial audiences won't go for that or that or that, and just do it. Yeah. You know. Yeah. I, I mean, I went into this book um, intentionally blind. Like I had an idea of, of what it was about, but I am so glad I didn't, you know, know the specifics because like you said, it just, I mean, it's off the rails, you know, and as stuff just kept picking up, I'm like, holy shit, what is happening right now? This is wild. So. Um, yeah, it's also probably the most fun I've ever had writing anything, both the graphic novel and the, the novella itself. Like what I write tends to be pretty dark, so I don't always enjoy it. Some of the subject matter can be pretty heavy, and it's to say that you enjoyed writing it a bit of a stretch. But this one was just, I was like that at the keyboard. <laughs> <laughs> it was so much fun to write it. And I was kind of, when the story takes over and you start to kind of get nefarious glee from the idea of a reader coming to that part of the story, you know, 
just, I don't know. It was so much fun. That's awesome. Yeah. yeah, yeah, yeah. You, you, no, you know, know. Sorry. Go ahead. Okay. No, go ahead. You got it. You got it, bud. Uh, uh, you know, in, in the 80s here in, in Brazil, we used to have uh, publications, issues called uh, photo novellas. Yeah. And it, it, it was very similar to, to that that kind of thing that you you publishing now because like uh, we used to have photographs and dialogues everything in a comic format but very very low budget which is not the case because when i went through your book i saw some things there very kind of kind of very expensive to do and, and i don't think you had references for that like uh, the car crash is amazing like you had to have your own car crash for that. Can, 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 you, can you walk us through that, that particular scene? Yeah. Um, it's funny because like, thankfully I've never been in a terrible car crash, not to that <laughs> severity, but I've been in cars that were hit, you know, T-boned and, and rammed into from behind, but it's the shock of that moment, you know? And I think it contrasts well with what he's talking about in that scene where he's basically on the defensive about not wanting to have children yeah. and you know his girlfriend is kind of like well you can't just write it off what about what i want and as they're having this kind of low-key debate but him with a certain degree of smugness like this is in my opinion it's never going to change the car represents you know face taking that option away from him that's the moment in which his whole world is going to be turned upside down and that choice is going to be removed. And I needed it to be a sledgehammer moment, you know. It wouldn't have been enough if she'd just gone boink. <laughs> <You're> right, right. <laughs> it needed to be, this is your wake up, you know. This is the moment of transference where this woman whose choice was taken away is about to be transferred to him. And there's a certain amount of, you know, kind of fun, I suppose, to be had from the idea that he's so cocksure about himself, that he's so set in his ways and he embraces bachelorhood. And, you know, I know I, I pull my own strings. That's it. And all of a sudden, the cosmos comes down and bitch slaps that out of him, you know. <laughs> so, yeah, yeah, it was it was a collision in, in metaphorical and, you know, physical as well. It was it was the impact was going to be the impact that he was going to be suffering for the rest of the, the story so yeah that was the moment that's the hinge moment for me that literally the inciting incident where worlds collide yeah so definitely i wanted it to be rough and impactful in every sense of the word and to be visually a punch in the face because that, was, that was accomplished yeah. Yes. Well, well, yeah. I mean, reading the, the prose version, too, I mean, the, the graphic novel nailed it, you know, the, that oh, whole yeah. scene is exactly the way you'd picture it. So it was um, actually and, and I know it's kind of, you know, expected of you to say this, but it, it honest to God is absolutely true that when I saw that art, I just there are times when when people do their interpretations of your work where you go, well, that's interesting. It's not what I saw, but it's your interpretation. So that's what I expect. And I love it. But this was literally like Jason walked into a door in the side of my head and went, looked at all the paintings. And went, oh. Yeah. No, it, it was great. Some great of when that it happens. Really, really uncanny. I, I got spooked by some of it. It was so accurate. How did you, I mean, how did you and Jason end up uh, teaming up in that vetting process when you guys ended up deciding to work together? How did that relationship come about? You know what it was? I give all credit to uh, Sean Sobzak as. Uh, He's an editor at um, at Storm King, and throughout all the short stories I've adapted for the Tales for Halloween thing, he reads the story and the script and has an instinct for who would do best with that material, art, like which artists would complement it, and he's never been wrong. And the styles of the stories that have been adapted are all so very different. So when it came to do this one, he immediately suggested Jason and he pointed me to some of the concept work he'd done for PlayStation games or video games like uh, Skyrim and Dead Space and stuff like that. Mm -hmm. And I thought for the nature of this story, that would be perfect. But I, I looked through his work and was astonished by it. 
but still even looking at his work i couldn't make the leap from seeing his other work to, to imagining what he could do with this and then when i saw it i lost my mind i, I just <laughs> I, I honestly can't imagine anyone doing a better job uh, yeah I, I would love to talk to jason too because i i, I he said he was going to watch so maybe he can he can chime in on the chat but I know these guys are just as curious because they're both the artists here, but, um, you know, the, the style that, that he used, like, it, you know, was, was, did he actually take photos and digitally add art over the, like to, to it, it, it's wild. Like it looks so photorealistic. Um, and you it know, was it's, funny to me because if you see at the back of the book, he has the sketches. Yeah. There yeah. as well. So I just assumed that they were all sketches to, um, inking to you know and his process baffles me honestly everything about jason baffles me because he's just <laughs> yeah I, I i would just uh disagree with john the best thing is it is it's not realistic it's more it's it, 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 it's a comic on itself it uses photographs photographs but it isn't realistic because it, it's it's a mixed style that has a has a, a an end and it, it and it's very graphic in in, in a violent way of inter interpreting that yeah it's gory and the best thing it's not realistic like a, it's far away yeah. from being realistic it's dramatic i would say and, and I mean, it is scary as fuck. i would <laughs> say that it's about as realistic as nightmares are yeah right yeah. <laughs> Yeah, exactly. Yeah. Like you that, wake up that, and go, oh, that, God, that didn't happen, you know. That that lady is creepy. <laughs> she is creepy. And I think, yeah. why? How could he do that? And the yeah. thing is that, that you were asking before about the car crash, but to talk about the woman there in the grocery store, that's what the, uh, inspired the original story was um, that I went into Walmart to get. A bag of sour candy and a bunch of other stuff, a bunch of candy. <laughs> and this kid just shrieked. And it was, I swear it was a cross between a dog in pain and an ambulance. <laughs> Siren. And I I had to look. And to my shame, everybody else was looking as well. And this kid was just standing there absolutely letting go. And I looked at his mother and his mother was just staring at the candy. And like she didn't hear it. And I thought, first... My initial impression was an uncharitable one. I thought, Jesus, lady, do something about your little shit of a kid, you know? <laughs> because I have, like, misophonia. It actually hurts to hear that. My, my whole friggin' skull vibrates. Sure, sure. And the second thought then was, Jesus, she's just checked out. What must she have to deal with, you know? Because she's gone. She's just staring at the shelves. And it struck me that because I'd had the first thought, Ugh, shut your kid up. What would happen if I went home and that kid was sitting there waiting for me? <laughs> said, what do you think now, you son of a bitch? I'd be like, oh, okay. <laughs> that, oh, that, that, that could make a great foreword for your book. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Well, was, I mean, people ask me all the time where I got the idea, and that's exactly where I got the idea because, oh. you know, it wasn't conscious as the best ideas aren't. But, yeah, I felt so bad about that moment of judgment, you know, like, your shitty kid and i thought well god you don't know what the kids what's wrong with the kid or if the kid's okay or you don't know what she's going through so mind your business clearly you know when nobody else is minding theirs either so i just i don't know i didn't i wouldn't want to feel like part of the crowd who thinks your natural instinct is just to stare at people you know yeah so i thought well you know imagine if fate made me pay for that moment of just judgment and stuck that kid in my life instead and started changing it that's perfect yeah oh man if my if my son did that i don't i i definitely wouldn't be checked out i'd be so embarrassed i'd be like all right let's go we're out of here no more candy uh, <laughs> i don't think uh, in a, i don't think i've been in a walmart where there wasn't a kid screaming or some <laughs> verbally abused their child <laughs> and it's like on airplanes as well i mean it's the most natural thing in the world the altitude fucks with their ears and you get it you know your, your kid can't help it but it's what fascinated me more about the, than the kid itself was that zombie-like trance that the mother was in. And that made me wonder, well, what the hell is she going through? It could be, you know, 
it might have nothing to do with the kid. But she were just for that moment was gone. Maybe she was fucked up. Maybe she was on dope. Who knows? Right? She went drugged up or could, could be depressed and shit. I don't know. But it just the visual of that kind of hit me right between the eyes, and I thought, well, I get to walk away from this. Yeah. She, she doesn't. Yeah. <laughs> what if I did yeah. it either? You know. Yeah. yeah. That's perfect. Yeah. yeah. It was a good. It was a, a good moment for stories. I feel bad for her and the the child, but yeah. When you when you write about characters like that, do you find that the characters come to you and tell you their story, or do you feel that you already have that in place as part of your process? I think sometimes it's suggested by people, real people. And, and when I see them, the, the kind of backstory starts to feed itself to me sometimes. And of course, you know, I, I mean, I like to people watch. There was even a story idea I had at one time about people watching where <laughs> this group of friends are playing a game to try and guess everybody's backstory and then it got darker and they started guessing how everyone dies and then it started happening and they were trying to question whether they were causing it and sure. they started unraveling the three of them there's romantic rivalry and shit but it was fun but yeah i love doing that and there's just people you see walking by and you go well this guy probably you know murdered someone this morning <laughs> he keeps doing it with his hands it's because he can't get the blood off you know so yeah i mean it does but then when i sit down with it it becomes a friggin you know thesis on that person i don't use all of it but i have enough to make them seem as real as i need them to be sure yeah, yeah. it's wild it's like when you you know obviously you know when uh, most writers probably feel that way right like when you're out in public you're just people watching everybody and like taking it all in and uh I just like I know my wife hates that about me sometimes because uh, I, I we at my three year old daughter's um, uh, dance recital was they were doing the Nutcracker and I felt like I was spending most of the time looking around at people like just seeing their reactions and like just thinking what what if like shit just went down in here right now like how would these people react like this guy would do that that oh, <laughs> you know? oh yeah and the yeah. other thing is out of context conversations you know when you walk into a coffee shop or something you sit down somebody's on the phone and they're halfway through the conversation and you're not trying to eavesdrop usually it's people who are really loud but they say something like when ken hears about this he's going to absolutely lose his shit no <laughs> don't tell me that near they're going who's ken <laughs> what does it look like when he loses his shit you know yeah. so I start finishing the conversation and it starts becoming something else and it will go away and then maybe a year later it'll pop right back up into my head and I'll go oh yeah that and I'll start writing it because by then I know what Ken is and what he's done my, That's my, great. Father was, my father and I would always sit at the mall when they had malls and I was at the, at the bench and watch the people go by and he told me always look at a person's shoes because the shoes will tell you what type of person that really is. So you don't change your shoes very often, especially on a guy. So if they're wearing, you know, sneakers or one type of person, if they're wearing boots, you can kind of get a gauge for what their life is like. So you look at the shoes with good dad advice. So if you're people watching, so well, I hope oh, man. Look at my shoes, yeah. because if people look at my shoes, the only thing they're going to assume is that I'm not nearly as successful as I pretend to be. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. My, mine are the whole gamut because I live out of the country, so Mike could have some chicken shit on them, and they could have the, <laughs> right. About the, it just makes them unique. Stuff. Them, it's a style, you know. You could say it's like yeah. a it's like a roar chef or something. Yeah, there's paint <laughs> on there, there's chicken shit, there's you know kids spaghetti sauce from them spilling dinner on me. But, you know, all kinds of stuff. Man, I intentionally wear my my dirty like white Nikes out because I have like nice ones and I'm like I'm not wearing those right now. Like uh, that's a special occasion. <laughs> like um, going you know Deep, out. There's a bunch of shoes, buddy. So you gotta, you gotta step up your shoe game. <laughs> that's how you easy. Know. 400 a pair or whatever they are right so <laughs> the last time i wore my nice shoes out when i like was uh for the christmas parade and immediately my son backed up and stepped right on him and i'm like well god damn it like i knew i shouldn't have wore these things uh so ever since yes, that you, moment you need shoes to put over your shoes yeah <laughs> those like yeah. the long shoes i used to have the rubber one <laughs> yeah 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 like spats do you remember those you can just like slide yeah. them on over Yep. <laughs> yeah. 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 Uh, Killen, uh, when you say you, you like people watching, that makes me think that you're a type of meditative type of, of person. Yeah. And, and 
by saying that, I imply that you, you don't rationalize too much on your ideas. But when it comes to creating something new, do you think that your experience, you know, the years you have gone through, it's an asset or is a liability? Do you mean years of experience in writing or years of experience in life? In life. Um, no, I think that... I think some of the unique stuff that I've gone through informs writing. I think I use writing as a way to explore all that, to try and make sense of it. Um, whether it be, you know, the loss of a loved one or um, romantic dissolutions, you know, it can be anything. Weird encounters, they can often serve as the kickoff point or they can just be a component um, that informs a story or they can be the whole theme of it. But I am always in whatever I write trying to understand something. Even Sour Candy was about going through reaching that point in my life with no kids, you know, of never having had children. And I would often have that conversation with myself. Well, do you want them? And half of me would be, yeah, I would love it. I do have that paternal instinct. And the other half of it questions whether I'd be any good at it. I'm sure everybody does. But for me, that moment coincided with that screaming child's to make that story worth writing because I wanted to, I wanted to write the most selfish version, version of myself, the one that was completely, no, I'd be terrible. I don't want to have them and explore what it would be like if that choice was taken away, which of course it is for lots of people, you know, male, female, sometimes people don't plan on it. Sometimes they do lose children, you know, and government interference telling you what you can and can't do with your bodies. There was a lot. But I kind of simplified it into just distilled it down into a kind of a Tales from the Crypt type story where just shit gets real, you know. <laughs> but yeah, it definitely it's very rare that I write something that's not my own exploration of my own past in some way. Just to trying to make sense of it. And hopefully some of the stories have helped me cope with some of my losses or insecurities even, you know. Um, they're all canvases for the things that I need to put in front of me to look at them in an effort to decode them. So, yeah, I think I think it's been a great benefit. On the flip side, it would have been nice not to go through a lot of that shit just like <laughs> right. Yeah, but, sure. Mm -hmm. But you, you, you're a better artist because of that. But oh, most definitely, most definitely, yeah. I think it be, I think it lends an authenticity to, to the stories that you're backing it up with something that hurt you or something you've experienced. And so you know what you're talking about. And I think it's it's helpful in conveying suffering, if if yeah. you know what suffering looks like. Definitely. Yeah, yeah. The, the readers they, they can smell it, you know, from miles away. Oh yeah, yeah. yeah. If, but if, yeah. You're, if you're a it fake, can, like can can make it. Oh, that's absolutely true. And and I mean, I read books by people who've been through the worst types of shit. And as much as I wish they hadn't had to go through that to be able to write that particular book, the book just lifts off the page you know those emotions come out in it and i mean whether i'm successful or not in doing that that's what i strive for so you always got to walk into the vault of your own head into where the dark things are and say all right come on your turn you know <laughs> yeah do you see, well, it's a, is sour candy going to be a standalone story or do you see it kind of a continuation a larger story arc also as well when we look at the graphic novel version of it i have um Ever since writing the original novella, I, I do have Hannah Ward's story, who's mentioned as the original original mother of the child right. that Foon inherits. I have uh, pretty much from start to finish worked out her story too. So awesome. I, I'm just kind of waiting for the opportunity to be able to write it. I have a bunch of projects ahead of it, but I think uh, I think that one's definitely coming down the pike. Awesome. Yeah, it seems like the kid's been around for a while, so they might be able to... He's been around, and it's actually more about the genesis of... And it goes into a lot more about the mythology of what these things are and the one that's assigned to basically start this ball rolling. He appears to be human, but he's actually undergoing the change into one of those deer things, and he's conflicted about it. So 
Yeah, it's kind of intriguing. It's intriguing enough that I want to. I definitely want to sit down and write it. It's just a matter of finding the time to do it. Right. Yeah, it sounds like a cool world to explore. Right? To see. And yeah, it I mean, yeah. Uh, yeah. Uh, honestly, I, I read the I read the novella in in one sitting. I mean, it's easy to fly through. I I have it right here actually. Um, hey, there yeah. you go. The de- there's the deer. You're talking about the deer people. Uh, the elders, right? Um, uh, so, uh, yeah. Um, I, I um. I could definitely see that uh, that backstory. That would be awesome. So that's exciting to to think about. But um, I, I, we talked about this off air. I wanted to to bring it up uh, without spoiling too much. But um, you know, the difference between the novella and the graphic novel, there are some some differences in there. Stuff you added um, that you know will surprise people from reading the novella. So. Um, I don't know how much you want to talk about that. You know, we don't want to spoil anything, but um, uh, I think it's important for people that are going to pick that up to know, uh, you know, there's some surprises in there. So, yeah, uh, I mean, I said, as cool as it is to have that project um, for people who have read the original novella, I didn't necessarily want them to just see the same exact story beat for beat in a comic version. I wanted, uh, I wanted to put some surprises in there. And I think in particular, the ending uh, is tweaked a little bit so that it makes a bit more sense. Um, yeah, it was a cool opportunity for me to address what I thought were some of the novella's shortcomings as well. And they're there. But um, yeah, that was a great that was a great opportunity. But also to throw in some more monsters and some unique, <laughs> unique events that aren't in the novella that I kind of retroactively wish were now. But... As soon as I uh, as soon as I knew we were going to have the opportunity to show in graphic novel form what these things were, I wanted to. I think I kind of wanted to throw Jason some challenges too because I I thought here's a regular scene in the novella where not much happens, so just monsters. I'm going to pack this thing with monsters and see what happens. <laughs> of course, he rolls to the challenge. It looks spectacular, but yeah, I definitely wanted to throw some changes in there so that people who are familiar with the story could enjoy it in another way, you know, and see, I have some surprises for them. I, uh, I, today, um, I, I was, I grabbed the novella after I read the graphic novel and I was like, wait a minute. Um, I don't remember that. So I was like going back and forth, like looking at the two and I'm like, it was kind of fun actually, but, um, yeah, it's cool. I, I just kind of fleshed out some of the stuff. There's the implication in the novella that, you know, his job has gone to shit and it's going to go to somewhere else. So I wanted to show that too because it gave us the opportunity to see how much he has declined visually in the graphic novel. Um, there's kind of a little, I guess you could call it jump scares if that actually applied to, to books, but <laughs> I want that little scene in the cab when he's decided to flee. Yeah, there's literally only one page, but I just wanted to throw that thing in it. And I mean, that was how I had described that is exactly what Jason did with it. And it's absolutely bonkers. I loved it. Yeah. Yeah, I and, you know, well. as a writer, like you work with words, and there's some poetry into making the things work right. You know, doing the right phrases on on, on the right tempo and everything. Yeah, and most of it, when you adapt to a comic book, you you have just to strip away. Yeah. And, and how do you feel about doing that? Is, do, you, do you think that it's downsizing your talent or is this another, another, another avenue to explore and you, you don't mind about it? I feel the same way about it uh, doing graphic novels or um, adapting for comics, the same way as I do about writing screenplays. It's actually incredibly helpful for a prose writer because it teaches you the value of economy and brevity. You know, because if you can look at a scene that you've written, that's all beautiful prose and, you know, wow, look at that writing. Isn't that spectacular? And you can distill that into a, two paragraphs that tell exactly the same story in two panels of a comic book. Maybe you don't need as, all of those <laughs> words as much as you thought. You know, are you trying to impress yourself? Are you trying to impress the reader? Do they need a full page of you telling them that the sun went down? <laughs> So, I know some it's, authors that come to my mind when you say that. <laughs> I, I, I know a few. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah. And, and the, 
describing <laughs> shooting a gun. Yeah, he shot a gun. We get it, okay? <laughs> yeah. Yeah. There's absolutely nothing wrong with beautiful prose as long as it doesn't get in the way of the story. Right. You right. know? Um, but, I mean, there's some some absolute masters of the form that I just, I'm in awe of their writing. But it should still serve as a story and it should keep the story going. And I've been guilty of overwriting in the past. You know, the stuff that I look at from 10 years ago and I think, Jesus, get to the point. You know, <laughs> the guy woke up, he still hasn't gotten out of bed, you know, 10 pages later, for Christ's sake. But I can tell you what <laughs> rain on the floor looked like. Yeah. <laughs> so, yeah, yeah. There's, definitely, there's definitely some great lessons to be learned about being forced to strip it down. Because if you can and the story is still there, Maybe you don't. Maybe you don't need to use as many words as you think. Uh, yeah, I just but, remember but, the first time. Oh, sorry. I was gonna say the first time that um, Joel and I worked on a comic. And um, granted, I'm <laughs> I'm just starting out on the pro side too, so I'm a rookie everywhere. But um, I I was trying to write the story as a book, as a novel, and um, I, I was just we decided to do it as a comic after we we created Livid, and um, I was sending him like paragraphs and then when i like scripted it out a bit and i was trying to have all these narration boxes in there he's like man you don't have to have all that because the art's going to show that you yeah. don't have to say he's doing this or that and i'm like yeah yeah um it's so because if you put all that narration into you're crowding out the art you know then yeah. you're looking for a bunch of boxes and not the actual visuals itself yeah you know but, uh yeah i had to learn that too i was the same i was going in there going okay so let me just put in that paragraph i wrote there so we're establishing the scene when the scene is established by the art. So I was like, oh, what am I doing? And then you got to think visual interests and camera angles, right? So you got to think, okay, the camera's here, this this panel, now it's over here, or now it's bird eye, now it's bird eye. It right. is absolutely one of my favorite things about it, about writing graphic novels or adapting for comics is that element of it. Is the whole, you're basically directing it, you know? And you can't just show two characters. I mean, you can if that's the style you're after, but two people in medium close-up talking throughout the whole comic is boring as shit. So it's the over-the-shoulder camera. You're basically choreographing it, and it, it adds an element that's not in prose that I find absolutely amazing. I, I love it. I love it. Yeah. Yes. It gives a challenge. It's like John would send me something, and it's a single panel, but there's two visuals happening at the same time. And I'm like, this is not possible in the 2D world. We have to figure out how to... <laughs> right. I just... The fall to like an aerial shot from above that show both of that, uh, you know, the two reactions of the two characters, but they're facing each other, and have, or you know, just something like that, or he's holding something in his hand, or, or you put a smaller panel and a bigger panel. And yeah, and it's to, crazy yeah. because I remember that one of the stories I adapted had just a picture of a farmhouse at night, and then I'd written it and I moved on, and then I went back and went, but it's tilted, you know, there's your angle. And I yeah. thought, if I was watching this. That's what I, that's how I want to see it. Yeah, you know, I, I adore that part of the process. I, I like taking the very stark, basic visual, and then being the cameraman and going, "Hey, wait, what about we do that?" You know? Yeah, yeah. it's great. I love it. I agree. I, I get, at first I was it was intimidating because I'm like, uh, just do whatever looks good to you. You know, <laughs> like whatever you think looks the coolest. <laughs> Uh, yeah, but now it's cool because like when you 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 think okay, like what's important in this this panel for them to see is it the facial expression, is it the surroundings, like, and then just figuring out the angle is you know like the worm's eye and, and bird's eye, like Joel said, you know, that depending on what you want to accomplish, and it's a, it's a blast. Um, like to your point, what you said, it, it feels like directing almost. Um, yes. It really does. So. Um, so I, that, I was going to ask you, uh, but you already answered it for me, is, you know, um, if you enjoyed this comic scripting versus writing prose. And, uh, you know, the, there's a lot of differences between the two. So I think the differences, yeah, make them, you know, you kind of can't really compare them. I, I like how much uh, script writing or adapting for comics has taught me. And I like how different it is. I like that I can write a 400 page novel and then have to write a 10 page comic script, you know, <laughs> and strip everything way down while still maintaining a level of creativity. When you talk about angles and how to shoot a scene that's not present in prose outside of my own brain, you know? Yeah. I love them both equally though. 
Yeah. Uh, one, one thing. One thing I noticed on, on your book, on, on your comic book, is that you you have a great time in there. You know, between the the actual uh, story, you know, the background story and and the scares. And sometimes when I'm watching horror movies, it, it's very hard for me to to calculate the right amount of time in telling the story until you get the, the new, you know, frightening stuff, new, yeah. new scare. How long is too long when it, when it comes to telling telling a story? I think if it's a story that where the characters aren't written well, then you got to come in with the scares really quickly to compensate. But if characters are fully fleshed out and you're invested in them, I think audiences will wait as long as you want, you know? I mean, look at something like Hereditary, let's say in terms of horror movies. Yeah, That's one that kind of, the minute you walk into it, you get this grim sense of something's not right, but it takes its time getting there. Alternately, you have something like The Ring, which gets there pretty quickly, yep. you know? So I don't know that there's a right answer for that. I think it, there's a, a lot of factors that go into when it's, acceptable to introduce the bad thing or the, the sudden scare but for me personally i like to introduce the reader to the characters and spend some time with them so that you ultimately care about whatever bad thing is coming otherwise it's just throwing bodies into a meat grinder you know? yeah <laughs> so, it's a slasher flick basically <laughs> yeah. exactly they always have fierce respect for movies that do take their time our books, our comics, you know, any medium that sets the characters up to be people you actually care about. When yeah. I can sit there and I say 20 minutes into a movie, I'll be really pissed if I'm not this character. I'll be really upset. <laughs> and you hug me. That's it. The hook is in my mouth. That's it. I'm screwed now. And then the yeah. whole time I'm on edge that something is going to happen to this person or these people or this couple who are on a road trip, you know, that aren't just stupid. <laughs> you just watch on your phone. <laughs> yeah, 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 yeah. Well, speaking of Flanagan, though, you know, uh, Midnight Mass, right? That's a perfect example of like a slow burn. Like, but you, like, I think it was episode five. I don't remember the numbers, but like that whole episode, I was on the edge of my seat. Like, I had goosebumps. I'm like, holy yeah. shit! <laughs> like, this is, is amazing. Or probably the best recent example that that I could think of as well. That's that's a great example because. I cared enough about everybody in it that he had me at the end of episode one. I was okay yeah. spending time with these people. But the problem is that the term slow burn has been vilified. It usually equates to boring as shit for the casual <laughs> moviegoer, you know? Yeah. When to me, that just means that I'm a sucker for that. If I hear, oh, it's a slow burn. I don't know if Rogerio realized he's not muted there. <laughs> he's got his kid, I think. Oh, I was going to say that, that body he had tied up downstairs somehow. <laughs> take a break to the door. Yeah. It's haunted from time to time. Yeah. I think of uh, character development, too. A couple of things. Um, was like uh, Ex Machina was like that. I don't know if you saw that. That was a great film. Where it's yeah. Film. yeah. And then also, obviously, The Walking Dead used that card a lot. And then... Yeah. Um, I feel like they got almost too many characters. So it was hard to kind of emotionally connect the one. They kind of revisited that when they went back in and started spending more time with character development. Everyone's like, "No, dude, we want more zombies and gore and, and you know well, crazy stuff." Like, character by then, you know, it, it yeah. makes no sense really to just to shift the algorithm at that late stage. You you've already gotten the type of audience who have come to expect a certain ratio, and instead you're coming in going. Oh, we're season of all the character work and people are going to be like brains man give them <laughs> yeah. Yeah. yeah pretty much yeah. um you you I, won the Bram stoker award back in 2005 what was that like for you and what did you do to celebrate <laughs> i'm not sure i can tell you um i uh, it's illegal it's fun yeah. <laughs> that's why i can't tell you but it was um it was uh it was surreal because um i thought there was absolutely no chance of winning that i didn't even go to the ceremony i was like why 
spend all I'm a broke ass, <laughs> right? We're gonna fly there just to lose. Um, so I remember the writer Lee Thomas actually messaged me. This was Jesus not that long ago, it was AOL. Um AOL I M. Yeah, uh, yeah, yeah. Yeah. yeah, back in the eighteen hundreds. Yeah. But um he messaged me and said, Congratulations. And I was like, literally, instead of like sitting by the computer waiting for the results, I stopped doing shit. I heard a beep on the computer came over and he went, Congratulations. And I said, For what? Said, you you won the stoker. And I went, No, I didn't. And he went, Yeah, you did. And I'm like, Oh, okay, thanks. <laughs> and then I went and made a cup of coffee and was kind of just sitting there going, Nah, no, nah, that didn't happen, <laughs> you know. And then I called my mom in Ireland and told her, and she'd been paying a lot more attention to this stuff than I had. And when I told her, she dropped the phone, and I could hear her out in the back garden doing a jig. <laughs> That's awesome. <laughs> That's when she, was, she was screaming at the top of her lungs, and neighbors were like, Are you okay? She's like, Woo. <laughs> So, uh, so that's what happened. Then when, uh, hearing that, I was like, "Oh, Jesus, that's real, right?" Yeah, I got I got spectacularly drunk for about two days after that. Oh, good. <laughs> so I, I can't, I can't <laughs> really tell you how I celebrated because I can't remember how I celebrated. Fair enough. <laughs> but it was yeah. fantastic. Yeah, I was I was really I was really shocked. I think that I think that. The category I was in had Stephen King in it, and I just automatically assume if he's in your category, go home. Yeah, yeah. But uh, right. it was it was crazy. That's awesome. That's got to be such a moment. I can't even imagine. That's just got to be like surreal, imposter syndrome, and all kind of. Oh yeah. Yeah, yeah, right. And I'll yeah. tell you what was crazy is because I could remember when I was eleven years of age, up in my bedroom in Ireland, reading some Dean Koontz book and it said in the bio part that he's the president of the HWA at the time and has won a Stoker award. And I remember at 11 years of age, I said, I'm going to win one of those when I'm a writer. But of wow. course I thought I'd be living in a mansion by now, you know, <laughs> all the movies that they've made of my shit. I thought I'd be like live high on the hog and I'd be looking at the posters like Tad Beaumont and, and just, yeah. So whatever, but that one came true. So I mean, you know, the rest might too. <laughs> yeah, you, you know, the, the game isn't over yet. That's so, right. That's right. That's yep. true. A lot, a, a lot to do. Your mansion can can be coming on your way. Yeah. <laughs> well, and as you want to talk full circle, the idea that I would ever be involved in any capacity with something that had John Carpenter's name on it is just forget it. This same. Yeah. Uh, like I talked about there about the Stoker Award when I was 11 years of age, that would have been right around the time that I was watching The Fog for the first time, you know, and just That's... and because I come from a, a seaside town, and I talk about this in the introduction to Sour Candy, the graphic novel, is it wasn't uncommon to look out the window and see fog rolling in off the sea. So when I watched that movie, I was the hair was. <laughs> my neck because i was like, right outside there i can see the sea from here is that clanking of change chains and you know ghost pirates coming up to the door and i loved how that made me feel i love that fear it was exhilarating so there's a lot of milestones in my life that have been marked by the first time i watched some of john carpenter's movies and he's easily my favorite horror director and i thought you know Another one of these 11 year old moments. Someday he's going to direct a movie of mine. You know, <laughs> this, as far as I'm concerned, is pretty much the realization of that because it's yeah. just, you know, it's crazy. Yeah. I think my brother showed me the thing when I was about seven. So that was a good uh, mark in my mind. I love it. That is my favorite horror movie of all time. Oh, I, that's my favorite movie. I have a, I've worn the shirt on the show many times. It's my favorite movie, period. Not even just a horror movie. So, yeah. Yeah, you never get um, it. You watch it probably forty times. Yeah, yeah, I agree. I, you know, I was gonna make the joke if uh, if Sour Candy ever got made into a movie, even if he didn't direct it, if he could just do the score, he he's he's uh he's touring. Uh, I don't know if he is at the moment, but he he tours around with his band and, and does his music and stuff. My right. my my best friend's a huge Carpenter fan, and like specifically the scores to all his movies too. And uh, he has all the albums that they put out and. Uh, I didn't even know he did that, that he toured and like 
like plays the music for like the scores that he makes. It's wild. And uh, he's also doing the score for that Foo Fighters horror movie that's coming out. Oh, I didn't even know he did that. That's yeah. that's cool. And yeah. he's a character as well. So. Yeah, that's awesome. Yeah, you know, guys, I I don't know about you, but I don't think the best stories are making to the big screens, not no, even no. to the smaller screens. They're not. I I spent so long, you know, just just flipping uh, over movies just to get something good, worthwhile, and it is hard, you know. And I always go to recommendations. I'll talk to my friends and say, "Oh, what's on the telly that I can watch?" Netflix, Amazon, Disney, whatever, and it's hard work because there are so many great stories out there yet to be told. And there's so much crap on, the, on, on uh, get, getting so much money, you know. And it's not about being good. And when I say that, I want to ask you, what 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 is your take on that? Do you think it's about being consistent? It's about just keep on doing it, or it's just a matter of luck? Because I don't know. I, I would love to know that. Um. Do you mean like um, about my work being translated to film, or do you just mean in terms of media? I, I mean, no, I, I mean, I mean about the in, in a general way. Good mm. stories. How can make it big? Like, uh, how can you make the, the big books out of it? You have to be consistent. You have to be lucky, or you just have to keep on trying and making many mistakes and meeting people, whatever. Honestly. Uh, Honestly, don't know because I, I, there are authors out there who've had bestsellers for 40 years now who've never had an adaptation of their work, you know, yeah. and nothing significant anyway. And you have kind of mediocre authors who every single thing they write becomes some kind of a, a TV series, you know, at least gets a couple of seasons. And it's also true that, you know, you can have terrible books be adapted into great movies and vice versa. I don't know. I mean, if I knew the answer to that, then I would be telling you all about the 19th. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. I, really... I, I think, I mean, not that I know either, but I feel like a lot of it has to do with like some of the best books have great inner monologue. They have all this stuff that like you just can't adapt into a yeah. movie unless you have like, um, like Dexter, like, you know, talking over, you know, his thoughts or whatever. But like, um, you know, it's hard for that to, to adapt over and then like you have you can when you read a book sometimes it, it can be like a mediocre book but the plot you like you get the point like the plot like this is a cool plot but it, you know it's okay written it's not amazing but like you can almost tell like that's made for a movie almost it, it just feels like um you know I guess I don't know how to explain how it's written necessarily, but it, it's more plot driven. You know, it's, it's not in a monologue. It's not diving into like the, the heads of the, the main characters and all that. So yeah, that's, I don't know. That, that's just how I kind of see it there. But, um, but I think there is an element of luck involved too. If your book comes across yeah. people at the right time, you never know. You, know? Yeah. So you could see, see the, the value in it as a film. For example, Sour Candy, the novella, when it came out, I posted the cover on Twitter. And within two seconds, Ryan Turek at Blumhouse said, how do I read this? Wow. I, immediately. And I said, um, I can send you a PDF. I sent him a PDF. And then for two years, we were trying to develop it as a movie. So you just never know. And also, and I can't really talk about this, so I'll, I'll have to watch what I say. But um, there's another book of mine that during the pandemic, a, a director I'm a huge fan of was basically scrolling the Apple store for something to read and he saw the cover of this book of Sour Candy and bought it, read it, and now we're in development on that as well. So oh, wow. purely out of boredom and the fact that the cover <laughs> spoke to him, which is why I always emphasize to people pay attention to your book covers, make them striking, you know. Yeah. Um yeah, so luck is definitely a part of it, you know. He could have skimmed right by that onto the next book, but here we are. I mean, the covers are so huge. Like, it's uh, a lot of the indie writers, they don't, you know, focus on that. And they could be some good, you know, um, undiscovered writers out there that just, you know, maybe it's they can't afford it too, you know, so you can't really knock them all the time. But, you know, if they just put this. 
yeah yeah there's there's definitely an element of that like i mean it's easy to just to shame people's terrible covers you know and, and a lot of people especially in the last couple of years they can't afford to spend that money on them but by that same token you don't have to have an incredible amount of artistic ability to just find a good image you don't have to pay very much for it you pay a couple of dollars for it and just get creative with with free photo um, manipulation programs like GIMP and stuff like that, or just find the fonts. Like the best thing to do is emulate the covers that you, you know, yeah. and just try and replicate it as best you can, or you know, go for the same kind of style. But it does make a lot of difference. It really does because there are books that I see being advertised on Twitter that have a thousand five star reviews on Amazon, and if the cover hurts my eyes, I'm going right past it. Yeah. <laughs> I can't have that on my shelf. It's ugly. Yeah. Even, um, if, you even if you love the, the writer. If I love the writer already, I'm I probably hunt down a UK edition with a better cover or a, a, <laughs> or a Kindle version where I can just swipe past it and not <laughs> it again. But if it's a new writer and I'm not familiar with them and their book cover is terrible, I'm more likely to just even subconsciously just kind of scroll past it you know yeah but um, by that same token like if i see an absolutely stunning cover even if the book itself doesn't sound like something that's up my alley i will buy it just to have it just to have yeah. it on my shelf because yeah. i, I the art yeah, yeah. yeah they're my friends in my studio my whole wall is comics a lot of them are covered yeah a lot of them are based on my cover that yeah. yeah yeah and, and that's the thing i mean this thing has to go on the wall immediately. Right, yeah. You, you know, if it's <laughs> something. Yeah, yeah, you have to sell the book. So you have to. Yeah. You don't mind if people just buy it and do not read it. Right. But I also. <laughs> as long as it's funny. And that's why the importance of my own covers is that it's the thing everybody sees first. Yeah. You know? Yeah. I need it to appeal to me as much as I wanted to appeal to people browsing bookstores. And especially nowadays, it's like shrunk down to that size on most storefronts, digital storefronts. So it's got to be something that you can see through the wrong end of a friggin' telescope, you know? Yeah. <laughs> so that's why I sometimes keep them very basic, like sour candies, as you saw, is like red with just that image. It shows up really well, small, blanky, black with a white baby's Pram in it, or what is it? Um, what, what is the American equivalent of the stroller? Stroller, yeah. right? <laughs> yeah. Um, House and Abigail Lane has the sunflower. I tend to like images that are stark, but you know, you shrink those way down, you'll still see that. It'll make you curious. What is that? Oh, ooh. Chaos. Yeah. So, so, yeah. The red background really is like a killer. Like it, it catches a lot of people's eye, but. Uh, yeah. It's yeah, we talked about doing that with some of our comics. We just love the the look of the red background. But um, you you did uh, recently you did uh, Brian Keane's Terminal, his author's edition uh, cover. Um, so, um, like I said off air, I didn't even realize you you did cover work. So um, I that's one of my favorite books that I've, I I I am embarrassed to admit I didn't read it till the author's edition because I love Brian Keane, but. Um, that book is amazing. Um, and I, when I saw the cover, I'm like, Oh, that's so awesome. And, and then I, I was like, wait, he, he did that cover. I'm like, no shit. <laughs> so, um, yeah, that was, he, when he wrote to me about doing the cover for that, I've done a couple of him, but that one, I remember reading that and really liking that book too. So it helped that I'd read it, but also I hated the original cover that was done for that book. It was yeah. boring. You know, I remember thinking that and this was long before I was designing covers. I just saw the book. I bought it, read it, hated the cover. So I thought if we're going to do the preferred edition, you should have his preferred cover. And whenever I, did, I watch Brian's tweets and the way he talks, you know, and the attitude he has, I, thought, <laughs> I know he likes Sons of Anarchy. And do you remember the promos for those always had that kind of yeah. dash of red on them? That's kind of what inspired that. I said, it suits his personality. It suits the book. And it just looks kick-ass. It's actually one of my favorite covers that I've done. I'm, I was really pleased with that one. Yeah, it's uh, great. Yeah, yeah, Killen, I, I want to use some of your experience, some of your expertise on creating titles. And by the way, Sarah Candy is a great title. 
And do you think there's a, a cover has to have a title and a subtitle? And if you have a good, great title, what kind of subtitle would you put on it? Something giving a hint of the story, something catchy. How would you do it? I'm asking it because we, at the moment, we are struggling. <laughs> I figured there was a reason. Yeah. Um, yeah. <laughs> well, I mean, the most obvious thing is the title should be evocative. I mean, I'm I try to steer away from boring titles because you know even if it's perfect for the story, if it's a boring title, you're already half losing whoever's looking at it. Like for instance, Sour Candy's original title was The Foundling, which is mealy mouthed and nobody's going to remember it um, because you know the, the Foundling is the the child in it, and I, I just I don't know. So most of the books that I've done. The title you see is the fourth or fifth one that came to me. Uh, but as far as subtitles go, honestly, I tend to either make it enigmatic and mysterious, or just if the story lends itself well to the kind of movie tagline. Like, um, <clears throat> see if I have it there um, somewhere. Um, Blanky has underneath it the gift that keeps on living, you know? So if you could come up with something clever and play on words or something that refers to, like that's accurate, refers to the plot and makes it mysterious without giving too much away, I say go for it or otherwise don't. Just, just use the title. Yeah. Of course, the best ever is uh, in space, no one can hear you scream, right? So, well, yeah. Uh, what a yeah. great, <laughs> they nailed that with Alien. Fantastic. Yeah. 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 Uh, oh, oh yeah sorry i had pulled this up earlier yeah um here's the, the cover uh minus the the sidebars there i don't know uh, oh this is because that's for the audiobook i got it um mm -hmm. but um yeah i love this cover um so i just wanted to share that when we were talking about it but didn't want to interrupt our conversation so um yeah we're at uh, the hour too just wanted to check yeah. in so yeah reach yep. that point so there we go awesome so yeah, well, thanks for uh, coming tonight, Keelan. Uh, let's get the last word. So uh, tell us where we can find Sour Candy, pick that up, and uh, what else, where else you got going on coming up in the future. Got the last word. All right. Uh, Sour Candy is available in comic book shops now, um, and I think it's uh, available on online stores, Amazon, etc., on March 1st. Nice. Am, well, I'll, I'll just so you know, Amazon. I thought I was going to get it March first. Amazon told me it would be here Sunday, so we'll see. Um, yeah. Yeah. Um, well, I saw uh, James <laughs> thought, tweeted out. He thought it was funny that uh, um, you can buy it at Walmart <laughs> because of the, the you know the the opening scene in Walmart. There, it's kind of mm -hmm. funny. So I um, think that's probably the only agree the only reason they agreed to stock it. <laughs> yeah. I'll have a, have a, a spinner rack in the candy aisle of all the Walmarts would be awesome to have. There, Wouldn't so. it? Yeah. yeah. That'd be and great. Some free bag of sour candy. That's awesome. <laughs> I did that too. Great. Awesome. Well, thanks again so much for joining us tonight. Anything else you got coming up down the pike you want to pop on and uh, grace us with your presence? Uh, certainly let us know. Be I'd be happy. delighted anytime. Thanks for having me. Oh, yeah, it's been a thanks. pleasure. Yeah, Thank keep you up feeling. Good. Yeah, keep up the great work and uh, keep us posted. Anything coming up? We we tend to adopt people when they come on, so we'll be uh, pushing. Yeah, I've been looking for a home, so that works for me. You know, I just have to make sure you eat the sour candy first. There you go. There you go. All awesome. right. Thanks. Have a good week, everybody. Thanks, yeah, have a, have a great night. Thanks, Keelan. Take care.